uh, given a seminar talk in uh, BIMS quantum uh, symmetry seminar. And uh, my talk today will be based on a series of work, joint work with Hao Zhang. And uh, um, so two of them are already uh, put on our path, and one of them said the second one that we can do a sit on it just uh, posted on our path this morning. Uh, and uh, we plan to have at least three papers in this series, so this project is still not yet finished. And, uh, uh, okay, so uh, so I will start my talk by talking about modern invariance, because modern invariance is a uh, central theme in the story of vertex of the algebra. So uh, in every breakthrough in this topic is a theorem due to Yong Chong Zhu. Uh, it says that, okay, assume that V is a so-called um, situ cofinite and rational VA, then the set of um, the set of characters, Q characters, defined by taking the trace of the Q to the power L0 minus C of 24, C is a complex number called central charge, then this function of Q extends a it's a it's a kind of uh they form a kind of uh model invariant state, it's a, a kind of uh vector value model form. But more generally, uh what to really prove is not just about these kind of functions, um, but are about, you, I mean, you, you, you should take care of not only these functions of Q, but you also have to take care of these linear functionals of V. So here V is a vector state as a VOA, it is a vector space V. So it is, you should really care about the, fun, uh, the function from E times H, H is the upper half uh, plane of the complex uh, plane uh, to the, the trace, and it's defined by uh, the trace of the vertex operator with value v equals one times the q tau to the power l zero minus v over twenty four, where um, q tau is defined by e to the power two pi i times tau. So this is a kind of expands a, a kind of vector space which is modern invariant. So the, the, the advantage of working with this space instead of the characters, uh, the one here is that so here it is. We can see that for different choice of uh, irreducible modules, and they are linear independent, but here they are not necessarily linear independent. So this is in some sense better, has a better mathematical uh, behavior than this one. So that's why uh, it's better uh, in BOA, it's better to, I mean, if you work with after story, then it's better to work with this one. But if you want to do explicit calculations, then you probably will start by looking at this kind of stuff. Um, and here, C2 component is a, a finite condition which ensures, for example, that uh, my VOA has finite, finitely many irreducible objects. And rational means that every module is completely reducible. It's a, a finite different sum of uh, irreducible objects. Okay. <clears throat> However, um, if I drop the rationality assumption, I only keep the C2 cofinite condition and I remove the rationality, then this, this model inheritance property uh, in the formulation of truth does not hold. Well, because it has been long observed that um, if you take, for example, you fix a module and you take the, just take the uh, Q character and you take, you, you apply the module transform, you get a new function of Q or function of tau, then this new function will contain some factor, which is the log of Q tau. So originally, this expression is only a fractional power of Q. But if you take the model transform, you will get some, uh, some log Q. So which means that this space is no longer no longer model invariant. So which means that if you want to, if you want to prove a, model, a type of model invariant theorem, you have to generalize uh, the Q characters. So that's the reason, that's one of the main reasons that Miyamoto in 2004, he generalized uh, the Q traces to the so-called pseudo Q, Q trace. Well, he kind of replaced this trace, this ordinary trace function by a more general type of trace, a more general type of symmetric linear functional called pseudo trace. And he used this pseudo trace to reconstruct this, uh, this expression and he showed that if we use these pseudo traces, then they again they form a vector space which is model invariant. Uh, so this is one of the main results in Miyamoto's paper in 2004. 
And later, we have another formulation of similar cue traces that were uh, signified by Arika and Arika Nabokomo. This is the background of my talk. So this here, that the M uh, is not required to be projected. And it's M is arbitrary. 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 Yes. Um, well, I think in, uh, no, I, I think if you want to, you want to define things, you, you uh -huh. want your M to be like projected over a sub-algebra of the endomorphic algebra, but it's not necessarily projected over B. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you see that the usual Q trace, I mean, the, the Q trace of this one is, you see, it, it's basically just a contraction, right? So it's quite compatible with uh, the zoning construction uh, in Siegel's definition of uh, CFT. However, it seems that serial traces or serial cube traces are, they are more complicated than the ordinary cube traces. And it seems that serial cube traces were not discussed in Siegel's formulation of CFT. So the question is, did Siegel really miss something? So the goal of my talk is to give you the answer. No, Siegel didn't miss anything, but slightly uh, adjust Siegel's uh, formulation of sewing construction. Uh, we can't recover the uh, serial code traces. So the main goal of my talk is to explain this, how to incorporate these, all these serial trace stuff into the framework of Siegel's sewing construction. Okay, I will explain, in particular, I will explain how this algebraic definition of pseudo traces matches the Siegel's geometric framework. And our explanation will be based on the uh, the theory of conformal blocks. And let me first mention that uh, the traditional approaches to the theory of conformal blocks cannot recover through the two traces. So in what follows, I will, uh, what I will do is that I will show you what our formulation of conformal blocks is, and I will point out our difference with the traditional one uh, to show you what kind of ingredients should be uh, added in order to uh, recover these to the Q traces. Okay. Okay. So let me turn to the conformal blocks. So, uh, so these are the basic data of the conformal block. So first of all, in my talk, I will uh, always assume for simplicity that my VOA is seems to cook on that. Although some of the results could be applied to a a broader class of VOA, but I will, for simplicity, assume that I will uh, focus on these c 2 co and VOAs. And uh, to talk about conformal blocks, I have to first fix a compact human surface, uh, not necessarily connected, and I have to put some mark points to see from here. P is a compact human surface, possibly have uh, several uh, components, and x1 to xn are some mark points. So if you look at this picture, then this picture has three mark points, and at each mark point, I choose a local point in eta. The so local point, it just means that it is a holomorphic injective function. But for, for example, eta one is a holomorphic injective function defined on a neighborhood of x1 such that it, its value at x1 is, is zero. So roughly speaking, it maps a neighborhood of x1 to an standard open, to an open disk and it maps x1 to the, uh, to the origin. Okay, so this is the meaning of local coordinates. And based on this geometric data, which I call the endpoint and common remote surfaces local coordinates, I can talk about conformal blocks. Okay, so I also need to associate uh, the modules. So here, um, for example, if I have three map points, then I have to choose a module W to be uh, a module of V to the tensor power of three. So in general, if I have n mark points, then W should be a module of V uh, n tensor power of B. Uh, and a conformal block is a linear functional on this vector space W, satisfying some um, covariant property or invariant property, which is defined using this the geometry of compact remote surface and the vectors of the algebra and the modules. Okay, so, so the precise definition is quite complicated, so I will not go through these details, but you, I just want to show you this, uh, the basic data I need in order to describe what is a uh, conformal block. And here I want to point out one very important difference between our setting and the traditional setting of conformal blocks. So uh, traditionally, when people study conformal blocks, people like to take this W to be a tensor product of V borders. It's, but if you take W to be in this form, then you cannot cover 
Let's see the two shapes. Okay, so uh, in order to get to the two shapes, we have to consider these modules of tensor products V or A, which are not, which cannot necessarily be written as the tensor products of V modules or the direct sum. So this is a very important difference between our setting and the uh, conventional setting. Okay. Okay, so next I will talk about sewing. So as you just look at the sewing of Riemann surface, then it's uh, very easy to understand. It's just the, uh, the where you, you, if you sew these three points, then you remove a small disk, you remove a small disk and you glue together, you glue them together. The way you glue them is defined by their local coordinate. Okay, so the local coordinates, it describes which formula you need in order to identify the point here with the point here. Uh, and after you glue them, you will get this, uh, in this example, this you will get a genus two surface from a, a genus one surface. So first, so you see that for this picture, it has four mark points. But in order to define the corresponding solving of conformal graphs, you cannot choose a module of V tensor four. Instead, you have to choose a module of V tensor two, a V module X, and a V module X prime. And you, your your conformal graph should be a linear functional on W tensor X, uh, tensor X prime. So X prime is the, well, the way people will call X prime to be the counter gradient of X, but basically it's the gradient dual, a kind of dual, dual representation of X. So it is a linear functional here. Okay. Uh, so in this picture, so W is a V tensor two module, X is a V module, X prime is a V module. But if you look at this picture, then W is a V tensor two module, both X and X prime are also V tensor two modules. So here I, I glue these two points together, I glue these two points together, and I get a Junior uh, three sphere from a Junior one sphere. This is what I call the self solving because all these mark points belong to the same component, but uh, it's more important in our story, it's more important to, uh, to consider the distance solving, which means that well, the, the, the pair, these two mark points that you need to solve the remand surface belong to different components. So uh, the other settings are similar. You glue them together, you get originally you have two components, each component are genus one. You glue them together, you will get a, uh, well, a, a, sorry, forget this, forget one, you just look at the bottom. Here you get a genus three stuff. Okay, so, so, so forget this one. The, the, the sony of X should be this genus three stuff. Okay, so again, you yeah, have so a, the sony of the top one is this. Oh, yeah, yeah, the sony <laughs> of this one is this. Uh, and the sony of this one is that one. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so any questions so far? Uh, can I exchange the self sony? So let's say X is uh, a two tensor, well, tensor of two V modules. Mm -hmm. That I can still exchange them first and then solve them, like in the second picture. You mean uh, this solve with that one and this with that exactly. one? Exactly. Um, good question. Uh, hmm. Um, but then you can do it in two steps. You first have a, you first change X. By a formal morphism, then so like mm. yeah, but you need you need the exchange to be the morphism of the cop. I have to let, right. let, let me think about this. Uh, can I get this? I maybe there's some value for me. Mm. Let me see. Mm. Uh, okay. So when I say that, let's say X is associated to these two points. Uh, so so X is a let's say X is a uh, B tensor B module. So, so these two actions are described by two vertex operators. Let's say this is Y1 and this is Y2. And I have another X prime. Uh, it is also B tensor V module. Um, uh, well, if you want to, let's say, so this one with that one, you have to switch the actions. Uh, I mean, I mean, when you define the conformal graph, uh, the conformal graph are defined by linear functional satisfying certain invariant condition. And to define that invariant condition, it really matters uh, 
let, let's say which one is for y1, is which one is for y2. If you want to solve this one with that one, you have to put the y1 action here and the y1 action here. Mm -hmm. And then you can do them together. Mm -hmm. okay. No problem. Okay. Uh, so next one, this is a theorem that uh, in a paper that we have just put on archive this morning, it's a conversion theorem. It says that based on the setting in the first page, suppose that the sign is a conformal block associated to the ability tensor x tensor x prime. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the Riemann surface before sewing. This is x, it's the one before sewing. And we can define a single sewing, which is a, uh, where you just take the contraction. It's very simple, the formula is very simple. And it's convergent, and it's not only convergent, but after you take a contraction, you get a new linear. If, if it, once you know that this is convergent, then it is a linear functional on W. And this is not just an arbitrary linear functional. We can also show that it is a conformal block associated to the Riemann surface after solving. Okay, so this is the uh, one of the main results of uh, our new paper. Okay, so this is the solving part. And in our series of papers, we always talk about. Uh, the word sewing factorization, we always view them as uh, together. Uh, so the sewing means one direction and factorization means the other direction. I, I guess I feel that in the literature, people, different people will, when they talk about sewing and when they talk about factorization, they, I always have the feeling that different people have different understanding of these two words. But in my talk, I kind of view the factorization as the opposite uh, construction of the sewing. What well, sewing tells you that, okay, you can construct a higher genius conformal block and a lower genius conformal block by, in terms of this uh, contraction. And the factorization is the opposite. The factorization, so if the factorization property holds, it means that you could get higher genius conformal block from the lower genius conformal block by taking this contraction. But the problem is that this factorization property does not always hold. Uh, what happened? Okay. Uh, uh, okay. You need to why is this? Let me check the uh, video. Okay. Okay. Now share. Maybe you just first scan the uh version of our video. Uh, okay. 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 Next one. Good. Uh, so, so unfortunately, the factorization property does not always hold, and this is the really interesting thing that I would, that. Uh, that is related to my uh, the, the 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 main thing I want to show in this talk. Um, well, so uh, about the question of when is this factorization hold? The answer is when your VLA is rational, which means that all the modules are completely reducible. The answer is always yes. Uh, this was uh, proved uh, by uh, it's uh, in order to get this one, you have to combine a important, very important factorization formulation of uh Dangdolini first year in one of my uh sewing uh, results, we combine them together, then you can show that okay, this is true when V is rational, but if V is not rational, then uh this is only true for this one sewing, but this is in general not true. But this is in general not true for oops. Oh, okay. So, um, but before that, I need, I, I want to give you some examples uh, that show you how this um, sewing factorization stuff is related to something that stuff is related to something that. Uh, the first is that okay, because I have a VLA module N, then the vertex operator could be used. So the vertex operator looks like this. It looks like y of v 
and z is a complex number, and nonlinear complex number, you can let this act on an element of my module m. And this is a uh, this is inside the so-called algebraic completion of m, and if you pair it with uh, element inside a gradient, you get a uh, number. And this could be viewed as a linear functional on v tensor m tensor m prime. So this linear function is a conformal group associated to this uh, genus zero sphere with three mod points, where at point one, if I put z to be one, then at point one, I put this module v, where at zero, I put n, and at infinity, I put n prime. So this is, uh, this is one of the most important examples of conformal block in my talk today. And uh, if you uh, do the Sony construction, do this single Sony construction, if you include, if you saw this, the point zero with the point infinity, you're the torus, right? And algebraically, you, what you do is that you just take the construction or you just take the, the, uh, the trace list and you, you, you get this, the, the linear function after solving. But you notice that there is a Q here. What is Q? The real play by Q is that the cross, the complex structure of your torus depends on um, how you choose for the local coordinates. If you, let's say if you scale the local coordinates at one point by some complex variable Q, then uh, the complex structure of the torus will re re rely on this Q. So uh, you have this uh, due to Q uh, to the power L zero, which, uh, which accounts for the certain kinds of change of coordinates. Okay, this is not a, a very important thing for my talk today. And another thing is that you may notice that there is a slight difference between the formula here and the formula that I gave you uh, several pages before. Is that previously when I talk about modern invariance, there is a it also power a Q to the power L zero minus C over 24, but here it is no C over 24, right? Uh, uh, there should be some expl explanations to explain why I do not include this C over 24, but uh, I prefer not to explain it. It could be explained it. Well, the, well, the wrong reason is that, okay, I, I, I have a connections, which is, I mean, these conformal blocks, they form a connections over the modern space, and you have a, this connection is modern invariance, but uh, this solving, this construction is not flat, it's only flat up to a, a projective term, which relies on this central chart, and it's for that reason that uh, this expression is not parallel under that modern invariance connection, but, but I mean, there are some stories, but uh, that story is not quite that closely related to my talk today, so I prefer to uh, not say too much about that, but uh, if I mean, uh, if you really want to uh, explain all these things rigorously, you have, you have to uh, cover these connections, this kind of thing. But for my talk, I prefer to, uh, uh, to, to, to ignore them uh, at this moment. And uh, I just want to point out that the key, uh, I mean, uh, a key ingredient, ingredient and probably the most important ingredient in a proof, in true proof of the modern invariance is the proof the genus one factorization, which means to prove that any genus one conformal block could be written uh, in this form. Okay, so this is the most important step in truth proof of the uh, modern invariance. Okay, and truth result, as I said before, truth result fails for irrational VOAs, and this, uh, this the failure of truth result, it, it gives a very good example. It shows that it, was, it is a typical example showing that. Uh, if your VLA is not rational, then the factorization might not hold for self-solving because the first picture, uh, the first picture is a self-solving, right? You, 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 glow these, you, you solve these two points, you get a torus. This is self-solving. And it suggests that, that, it suggests that the self-solving does not hold in general. Uh, I mean, the factorization does not hold in general if, you, if your geometric setting is a self-solving. But it turns out that for this joint solving, um, the factorization still holds. So, one of our preliminary version of the Sony factorization theorem is that okay, if you uh, only consider the constraint solving, then you can still get this factorization. Your higher genus conformal products can still be recovered from the lower genus one by taking the single uh, solving or just taking the root of contractions. Okay, so it seems that at this point, uh, you still cannot figure out how this. So stuff is related to the serious traces because serious traces is more complicated than just taking the ordinary contractions. So in the following, what I will do in the following slides is to first I will show you what is a serious trace and I will show you how serious trace could be explained 
uh, in our framework. Okay. Uh, so I will give you a very quick um, quick lesson of what is a Julia Q trace in uh, in a in a version of Eric and Nagatomo. So our starting point is a V module N, and the so M is the V module and M prime, the graded drill is also a V module. So you see M tensor M prime is a V tensor V is a V tensor V module, right? And we know that this this vector space is uh, canonically a non-unital subalgebra of, of the in the modern of the algebra of linear operators on M. Okay. The reason that it is non-unital is because the identity element is is well, as long as your M is infinite dimensional, this element. Elements here, as you regard it as the in the modulum, it cannot be the identity map. So it's uh, in general not a, a non-unitary subalgebra. Okay, so I call this this subalgebra to be n with superscript zero of n. Okay, um, and it has a subalgebra and a zero n. It is defined to be all the elements inside n zero n, which uh, okay, I forgot to mention what is a. So A is a A is the subalgebra uh, of the, the opposite of the in the moment. Ah, sorry, it's the uh, maybe after use the uh, use the cursor to show the audience online audience that yeah. So here's a typo here. It's not the it's not the N A M. It is the N V M. It's the in the moment um, with respect to the V accent. Okay, so here's the here's a typo here. So on the platform, it's the N V M. Up. Okay, so uh, so A is the algebra of N V M of, and uh, because the N V M is always is necessarily finite dimensional, so A is also um, finite dimensional, and uh, so we can consider N A zero M to be uh, the elements of all N zero M which commute with the action of A. In particular, the vertex operators always belong to this N A zero M because the vertex operators are. Uh, uh, commutes with the action of A, right? And it, in order to define the two tricks, I have to assume that N is projected as a right A module. And in that way, there is a, uh, there is a canonical way using this kind of uh, projective basis to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to construct this two trace, where this two trace construction will give you a symmetric linear functional on N A zero N from any symmetric linear functional of A. So if I call omega to be a symmetric linear functional of A, then the new symmetric linear function on in A zero n is called a trace with superscript omega. Okay, so this trace superscript omega is called the, the pseudo trace with, with respect to uh, the omega. So there is a, there is a canonical way to uh, to define this. Okay, um, in order to define the pseudo q trace, but you will really just need to uh, put this. Vertex of a chart times q to the power l zero. You, 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 you plug this inside this trace of omega, and you get then you will get a uh, genus one component block. Okay, so this is the to the trace construction in the setting of Arikuna Nakatomo. Okay, is the, is the trace positive? No, what do you uh, like, like if I put trace omega? Yeah, uh, no, it's not positive. It's not. It's it's when I consider all the possible. Dimension in a function, though, say it could be any complex scale. But well, it depends on omega. Like if I pick the right omega. Uh, mm. I don't expect it to have any positivity. Um, No, I I don't I I, I think that only in a rational and unitary case you'll get a positivity, but in this case you won't get this. Okay. No, it's not because I want you to turn it. Okay, okay, okay. So this is a, this is a very different from the unitary mm -hmm. Uh okay, so uh, in this class I will start to explain how to realize the huge Q trace uh in terms of the previously mentioned uh, seagull sewing. So uh, so our Sony factorization, our Sony factorization theorem tells you that any genus one conform block could be realized by solving two genus zero conform blocks by taking this uh, this joint solving operation. 
which means that here on the left hand side I have a I have a sphere with three mouth points. On the right hand side, I have a sphere with two mouth points, and I glue the top, the two points on top together. I glue the the two bottom point, the two points on at the bottom, and then I'll get a genus one, right? So, so for here, for the sphere on the left hand side, I need to uh, choose the conformal block, which is the linear functional on V tensor X prime. So V itself is a module of V, and uh, X prime is a conjugate gradient of X. F is a V tensor V module. Okay, so um, so left hand side is a conformal block associated with the sphere with three mark points. The right hand side, uh, I choose another conformal block for the top uh, associated to the sphere with two mark points and the module X. And then uh, if you glue, if you sew these two uh, uh, conformal blocks together uh, by just by using the contraption, then you will get a according to First dimension result, you will get a uh, genus one conformal block, and uh, our sewing fact transition theorem will tell you that every genus one conformal block ar arrives in that way. So, in particular, if you construct a genus one conformal block using the first dimension pseudo Q traces, then the pseudo Q trace can also be realized as the sewing of some psi and some tau or a common or a linear combination of them. So, the natural question is how to give a direct uh, realization of a pseudo trace construction in terms of this psi and tau. And here's the answer. Uh, recall that in order to define the pseudo Q trace, I have a uh, associated algebra A, which is a uh, sub algebra of n v zero n, right? And I assume that n is projected as the right in module. And uh, so now I take this x, the v, I want to get a v tensor v module. X. I just define X to be the N A zero N because N A zero N is a V tensor. I mean, at least it's obvious that it is a subspace of N tensor N prime, right? And N tensor N prime is a V module. And using the fact that this N A zero N commutes with the action of A, using the fact that it uh, commutes with A, you can, if you can either show that it is invariant under the action of V tensor V. So we can show that this is a V tensor V module of M tensor M prime. So we can just say X to be this algebra, but now I view it not as an algebra, uh, but as a V tensor V module. So this tells you what you should put this X is in order to uh, realize this to the field trace in terms of the pseudo solid. And what about this Poisson and tau? For the tau, you just take it to be the pseudo trace of omega. And what about the Poisson? If you still remember, firstly, we have this, um, okay, if you remember this, we have a, we have a phi here, right? We have a phi here, which is a conformal block. Uh, it is a linear functional associated on V tensor M tensor M prime, but in our setting, we can descend it to a linear functional on V tensor X, uh, v tensor, I should say, x prime. Uh, x prime is a, a kind of portion of this. We can, I mean, you can, and then you can descend that linear function of two. I mean, this expression, you can descend it to a uh, conformal block of, uh, associated to v and the contra gradient. This n a zero n is the contra gradient module of n a zero n. So this gives you what this psi is, and it's not hard to show that. The solving of these two conformal block is the same as uh, the, the Q trace. So this explains how to view a the Q trace in terms of the uh, Siegel's solving construction. Okay, so this is one direction. It shows you how to go from the pseudo Q trace to uh, the Siegel solving. Okay, so I think this is one half of my talk. And as you can guess, but the second half of, of my talk is to go the other direction. I have to explain, um, at least in genus one, how to realize this uh, Siegel solving this solving fact position theorem, uh, go from that side to the pseudo trace side. Okay. Uh, to discuss the other direction, I need to uh, do uh, some more preparations. Okay. Uh, we have to give a more precise version of the Sony factorization theorem, which also relates 
the dimensions of spaces of spaces of conformal blocks before sewing and the dimensions of the spaces of conformal blocks after sewing. Okay, and to talk about that more precise version of uh, the sewing factor addition theorem, I need to introduce the notion of real fusion product and fusion product. In some way, this is a heterogeneous analog of the well-known uh, fusion product. I mean, the what people usually talk about fusion product is a fusion is a is a kind of genus zero fusion product. So we can also talk about heterogeneous fusion product. So the setting is the setting is that okay, uh, I have this human surface, uh, from my human surface with a lot of points. I separate a lot of points into two groups. Uh, the blue ones are regarded as the incoming point, and the right hand side are, in some sense, the outcome, outcoming points. For the left hand side, I fix a, uh, a weak answer n module. Suppose that there are n mod points uh, on the left hand side, and on the right hand side, it is indeterminate. So I, I just leave this, this blank. So I just fix the module on the left hand side. So you just think about you, you, you put in the input itself is on W, and there is some, there is a, the output. Uh, I mean, you could put up, you could on the right hand side, you could put some module. There are, there are many possible choices of modules, and when now you fix a module N, which is a you can say air module, uh, you can choose, you have a lot of choices of conform plus, and there is a universal way to formulate these things. That is, so there is a universal things. Well, uh, well, this is the really the definition of field tensor product. It is a so it is a uh, we can say air module called a box back, box back slash w, and together with this uh, trivial letter gimbal, uh, this is a conformal block associated to this data satisfying a universal property such that any module you put on the right hand side and any conformal block you choose could be factored through this, uh, factored through the canonical conformal block gimbal. And a homomorphism. So, in, in some sense, it says that you can use the homomorphism to represent any conformal plot on, on the right hand side. This, so, this really looks like, so if you recall the definition of, let's say, tensor product of over uh, a field or, or a ring, and this is very similar to the definition of uh, tensor products of modules over a ring, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, okay, so this is. This is a dual tensor product, and a, or more precisely, the dual fusion product of W along this uh, geometric Riemann surface, data the Riemann surface X, and this uh, given F is called the non-dual conformal block, and the contagrient of this dual fusion product is called uh, the fusion product. So, as a typical example is that if you have uh, on the left hand side, you put this is W1, this is W2. Well, each of them is a V module, which means that here you should take W to be a W1 tensor over C, W2, so that this W is a different V module. Then if you take X to be this data, then what you get is the, what you get for this fusion product is the usual fusion product that we talk about when we talk about the tensor category of VOA module. Okay, so this is really a higher genus, more general uh, definition or setting for the for the for the notion of uh, fusion products. And this is the this theorem, the existence of this uh, zero fusion products and fusion products and canonical moral block is not trivial at all in the non-rational case. And this existence is uh, one of our main results in the our first series of papers. So this is the first. Uh, paper here, which we post uh, on our paper last year. Okay. Uh, and with the help of this real fusion product, we can, uh, okay, so before that, we, we have a example in the rational case. In the rational case, if you, okay, I'm sorry that here I, I kind of switched the orientation here. I'm putting, I'm going from the right to the left. Uh, so the input points are on the right, and here you put W1, W2, and W3. Uh, then and uh, the two mark points on the left are outgoing points, and the dual fusion product could be determined to be written down explicitly using this uh, using this formula. Okay. 
Okay, so with the help of uh, the notion of fusion product and dual fusion products, we can talk about our more precise version of the phony factorization theorem. It's say uh, we can describe it in terms of an explicit isomorphism of vector spaces. Roughly speaking, it tells you how the higher genus conformal plot could be related to the lower genus conformal plot. Look, look at this picture. Uh, suppose that uh, I have a higher genus compact my surface. And I group again, I group uh, the mark points into two groups. Uh, on the left hand side, I associate a module W. On the right hand side, I associate a module N. So, what the Sony factorization theorem tells you is that you can, you can replace the whole green part with this red fusion product. Okay, so this matches space, this space of conformal block could be replaced by that one. So, you have a Isomorphism from the left hand side to the right hand side. This isomorphism is explicitly defined in terms of the sewing with the uh, canonical conformal block because you see that like here you put the future product of W. So here in all that, because I want to sew these red mark points to these red mark points. So if you want to sew these together, you want you use a of these two set of modules to be convergent to each other. So this is the future product. This is uh, your fusion product. Um, and then for the left hand, for the green part, I choose the conformal block to be the canonical conformal block, the gimbal X. And, and you use this solely construction, you can get a higher genus uh, conformal block in our theorem. It tells you that this, this so called solely factorization map is if a linear isomorphism for the solely factorization. Okay, so this is our uh, precise version of the Sony factor theorem, which will appear in the, in, the, in, the, in the third part of our series of paper, probably will be posted on archive next year. Okay, uh, okay. so after talking about this general higher genus stuff, I will turn to the special case of genus one. I will show you how this genus one Special case of the Sony factorization theorem will uh, will give you all the pseudo Q traces. So, uh, for example, in the first page, if you take uh, this, uh, the, the Riemann surface of the going to be the genus one stuff, then what you get is with well, this picture really, really specialized to. Okay, I want to turn to the next page. Uh, okay. But, Oops. Oh, oh, okay. So you see that it is. So this is the, you see this corollary, right? And here this is, this is a special case of the Sony factorization theorem. Okay. Uh, this is the junior one chorus. And I, if you replace the Sony factorization theorem, tells you that we can replace this whole green part with the fusion product of V along this, this Riemann surface with one input point and two outgoing points. Okay. So this, so this is the, so, so we see that this, uh, this dual fusion problem is a V tensor V module. Okay, so, so this is uh, uh, this this V tensor V module was first uh, started by Hyun Lee, and Hyun Lee called this to be the regular regular representation of V because he, he thinks that this regular representation is is uh, similar to the, the the group algebra of a finite group. So he, he called this regular representation uh, and. So at least our Sony factorization theorem tells you that we have this isomorphism, which realize, which which uh, which establish an equivalence between the genus one conformal block to this genus zero conformal block. So, the, so you see, on the right hand side, it is the space of conformal block associated to the sphere with two mark points, and for the two mark for the the, the v tensor b module that you should associate to that two mark points is the fusion product of V with respect to the P. Okay, so P is uh, this, the geometric data on the top right, uh, the, in, the, in the first one on the, on, on the, on the top right-hand side. Okay, so this is the special case of um, our Sony factorization theorem. And if you are not familiar with this uh, fusion product of V, then uh, I can show you an example. In the rational case, this uh, fusion product of V is just the direct sum over uh, M tensor M strong where M goes through all irreducibles of the equivalences. Okay. So, uh, okay, I will show you how 
to get the pseudo cube traces. But in order to get the pseudo cube trace, I not only need this uh this this box tensor v to be a v tensor v module. I I also need more about that. We can actually show that it has a natural non-unital associative algebra structure, which is compatible with with its uh, v tensor v module structure. Okay, so the really the really good thing about think, thinking about it as the associative algebra is that we can compare the model category of associative algebras with uh, the model categories of VLAs. And in order to comp in, in order to relate these two categories, you cannot just use any an arbitrary representation or left model of this associative algebra. I have to consider a special class of uh, a certain algebra called what we call political bearing uh, left modules. But the, the, the main reason is that because this associative algebra box center V is not unital, it follows that not all left modules are quotients of three modules. So in order to get good, good left modules, we have to look at these quotients of three modules. So we call these uh, modules to be political bearing left modules. And we also want my uh, modules to be uh, not only quasi coherent, but also finitely generated. So I call these uh, finitely generated quasi coherent modules to be coherent modules. So, for example, the, uh, this algebra itself is quasi coherent as the left module of itself, but it is not finitely generated. In general, it's, it's not finitely generated. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, if you do, if you really want to get a finitely generated uh, quasi coherent module, you have to, for example, you have to multiply uh, to the right hand side of this algebra by some endomorphism, uh, sorry, by some uh, identical to get some finitely generated uh, F models. Okay. So, um, okay, after I, I have selected this, the a good class of left modules of my associated algebra. I also want to con uh, construct a functor from the category of V modules to the to the category of uh, the left modules, uh, coherent left modules of my associative algebra. So in order to define this functor, I have to use the uh, universal property to record that if I start from a V module in, uh, then I can use my vertex architecture to define a conformal block associated to the three-pointed sphere, where at each three points I put the V and an in front. Right? This is a this is a linear function, but this is the conform front that we have that has appeared in my uh, talk several times. And uh, now record that we have the definition of dual uh, function product. It tells me that this conformal block phi could be factored through a homomorphism from M from tensor n to the dual function product. Okay, so in other words, I get this. This is a uh, this morphism. This this is a v tensor v morphism from m tensor m from tensor m to uh, dual function product v. And if you take the transpose or more precisely the gradient transpose, you will get a linear map from uh, the box tensor v to m tensor m prime, which is just the n of n zero of m. And it turns out that this transpose is also a, it's, it's clear that it's also a V tensor B module. Okay, so this is, this is the, this morphism is the map that I need in order to uh, define the associative algebra module that corresponds to the v, v, VOA modules. But precisely, since we, since M is a VOA module, uh, since M is a VOA module, we can also show in a, in a, Future work, we will show that this pi m is not only. Oh, okay, we can show that this pi m is not only a v tensor v module homomorphism, it is also a algebra homomorphism. Okay, so therefore we can use this pi m to define a define us to define on this vector space m the structure of a structure of a left module for that. Associative algebra, and it turns out that this left module of my associative algebra is coherent. And moreover, 
we can show that if n is a projective generator in the category of uh, V modules, uh, then this this pi and this representation is faithful. What it tells you that it, what it tells you is that you can, if you choose your n to be uh, also an arbitrary associated with a projective generator, then you can use this. Uh, you can, I mean, you can use the uh, the algebra structure of the endomorphism algebra of n to describe the algebra structure of the box times v because it's not it's faithful. Right? So, so it, it faithfully it, it, it remembers the associated algebra structure. The, the endomorphism algebra of n it remembers the associated algebra structure of uh, box and v. Okay. So this is my proposition, which tells you how to define the functor. And once I have this functor, we can uh, compare the category. It's a very nice equivalence theorem. I tell you that uh, the previous defined functor is indeed a linear equivalence from the linear category of uh, V modulus to the uh, linear category of, uh, uh, of the left, uh, coherent less modulus of this uh, box tensor V. And the right-hand side is uh, the co this coherent category is indeed also a uh, a a abelian category, okay. And so it means that once we have these equivalence of categories, we can uh, we can reduce uh, certain parts of the study of the conformal blocks uh, to the study of the associated algebras. Uh, for example, uh, you can reduce the study of projected V modules to the study of projected coherent left modules of that associated algebra. So let me call my, okay, so in, in this theorem, um, I choose M to be a projective generator of a V module. So according to the previous theorem, I told us that M is also a projective generator uh, inside the category of coherent uh, left modules of the uh, associated algebra box sensor V. And now I take A, to be the opposite of the endomorphism algebra of n with respect to v, which is, so you see that these two endomorphisms are the same because of the previous theorem about the equivalence of categories. So I take a to be this finite dimensional unit to algebra. And uh, because n is the projective generator, you can show that n is projective as a, as a right a module, and therefore we can define um, a single traces. And we also know that at the beginning, initially, my pi m is a, is a map from box tensor v to n zero m, but we can also show that its range is inside the n a zero m, just by using the fact that a commutes with um, the vertex properties. We can show that the range of pi m is inside this n zero a m, and therefore we can use this to the face map. You see, it's just not originally, it, trans it, it, it sends a symmetric linear functional on uh, the endomorphism algebra to a symmetric linear functional on the n a zero n, and then I, then I can pull back to a symmetric linear functional on the box tensor v, and we can show that this symmetric map is a linear, linear isomorphism by explicitly constructing its inverse. Its inverse is also given by a a certain version of the pseudo trace construction. So we so these two spaces are really equivalent vector spaces. Okay. So um, and now we can combine all the previous results to relate the space of porous conformal blocks to the space of symmetric linear functionals on the endomorphic algebra. Um, uh, first of all. Recall that the Sony factorization theorem tells us that the space of torus conformal block is equivalent to the space of conformal block associated to the uh, sphere and with two mark points and the module box tensor V, right? So now we look at the right hand side. Let's look at the, the conformal block on the right hand side. So this is a conformal block. So in particular, this and a conformal block, an element here is a linear functional linear functional on the box tensor V. And the truth is that the linear functional is precisely a symmetric linear functional. So this is the second line, the second equality is easy to see. Okay, so the, 
So it shows, so it tells us that the conformal block, torus conformal block A is the same as the place of symmetric linear functionals on the box tensor B, and the curvature theorem tells us that the space of SLF on the box tensor B is isomorphic to the SLF of the endomorphism of B, and the open algebra of M with respect to B. So we combine all of them together, we obtain this isomorphism. Uh, so this is an isomorphism from the space of torus conform problems to the space of uh, symmetric linear functionals on the N, B, M. And this isomorphism is implemented by a composition of the 35 position isomorphism and pseudo switch construction. And this uh, this isomorphism is previously uh, conjectured by Galilee, North, and Bronco. And it turns out that this isomorphism is a, uh, I, I, I feel that this is, uh, in my, uh, to my knowledge, this is probably, probably the first formula uh, for computing the dimensions of torus conformal blocks that is both general and practical. So first of all, it's clearly a general formula, right? It, it applies to arbitrary typical kind of not VOA, even not necessarily self-field, because uh, there are many important classes of a uh, single cofinite neural A that are conject at least conjectured to be not necessarily self clear. For example, the uh, triplet, the W algebra W two three, uh, some examples. And uh, uh, this is a general formula, and it, it is also useful. It could be used to do some calculation to compute the dimensions of conformal blocks. For example, if you take my V to be the triplet algebra W P, uh, it was known before. To the work of Adamowitz and Milas, that the dimension of the torus conformal block is 3p minus 1. The, re the method they use to compute uh, the space of conform the dimension of uh, space of con torus conformal block is, is by combining two results. First of all, first of all, they use the model differential equations to get the lower bounds. They show that the lower bounds is 3p minus 1. And then they, they they study the two algebra, and the result on two algebra give, the, give them a upper bound, which is also three bound, three minus one, and then they combine them together, they show that this dimension is um, precisely three p minus one. And now using this formula, uh, using our formula, uh, we can give another uh, proof without using the modular differential equations. Uh, here's the argument. Um, so, so we know that it suffices to compute the, the dimension of symmetric linear functionals um, in the morphism algebra of any uh, projective generator N. But uh, in 2009, Nagatoma and Suchia, they show that the model category of a triplet algebra is isomorphic to the uh, category of a finite dimensional, uh, category of finite dimensional representations of the uh, restricted quantum groups uh, UQXL2 where QS e to the power i pi minus uh, over p. So it turns so according to our formula, it shows us that uh well, I mean, so this formula, so it shows that there is a according to this isomorphism, we know that in the category of mod wp, there is a projective generator whose endomorphism algebra is the UPSL2. It's because on the for the category on the right hand side, there is a very standard projective algebra. Generator, which is the algebra itself, right? So it is, this algebra itself is a projective generator. So it is also it also corresponds to a projective generator of WP. So therefore, uh, this projective generator also has the end of an algebra to be UPSO2. So therefore, we can take this NVM to be UPSO2 and show them that the dimensional conform block is the dimension of the SLF of UPSO2. And because this UPSO2 has a uh, non degenerate dimension in a functional, so therefore, the space of XLF is isomorphic to the center of that uh, quantum group. And it was known before uh, that the center has the dimension of 2p minus 1. So combine them together, we could show that the dimension of the one block is 2p minus 1. So this gives an, an example of how to use that general formula to explicitly calculate the dimensions of torus conform blocks. OK, so I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. I guess first talk recording.